Okay. <laughs> so it sounds like they're tag teaming. And we have Howard McLeod from the Moffitt Cancer Center and Sirica Meth. I'm not going to say your last name correctly. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> My last name is Mahasiri Mungkun. So it's so long. Anyways, you can call me Sirica Meth. <laughs> uh, from the Thai Ministry of Public Health. Thank okay. you. Uh, so we are tasked with uh, seven questions, and uh, it's about the key gaps and what we said at once in clinical implementation uh, of genomics, pharmacogenomics could be having greatest likelihood of contributing to eradication of preventable causes of Steven Tens, the key barriers, resource, and recent development, and what is the most promising uh, opportunity in the next five years, and what is the evidence base needed to implement the screening testing, and what alternative to the last uh, prospective clinical trials, and it seems that the question is overlapping in somewhat. So, uh, we did the survey, uh, sending the questions to the uh, working group participant, which is about 20, and I got nine response. And the summary is in the uh, most promising opportunity in the next five years from the pre-survey. Uh, the one interesting question that uh, keep coming up is about how to uh, recommend testing in the admix population, where the prevalence of the admix and leave is varying between race and ethnics. And this is going to be more complicated in the next, uh, next generations if we have a half Chinese, half Caucasians, and uh, a lot of mixings in the population. How can we going to be reliable uh, uh, recommendation based on race or ethnic? And the next uh, promising thing is that uh, uh, we should develop the low cost pharmacogenetics assay that can be included in the state or national health program because in the cost benefit uh, equation, we can do two things, right? Lowering the cost of testing or increase the benefit of the testing. So uh, the one equation that uh, Thailand did is that we uh, providing the test as 30 dollar. Mm. Yes, and then uh, it's become, uh, the cost-benefit equation become uh, uh, good in, in Thailand setting, despite the fact that we use the test hole of uh, one quality, just live years, 4,000 US dollar, comparing to 100,000 here, or, or 50,000 in Singapore. And uh, the, the next thing is to include the genotype data in the medical record. How are we going to implement this uh, testing? in the clinical uh, uh, electronic health record setting, how to include the interpretation of the next generation sequencing data. And two of the test uh, drug that we think is promising is the uh, test based on the chromosipine, HVB-1502 and HVA-3101, and the alumphrenol, uh, HVB-5801. And we, we received several comments that uh, uh, these tests should be implemented in the high risk populations, and we have we should have a, a impact study uh, to study the impact of this testing on the prescription pattern and the behavior of the uh, the one who uh, receiving the test and the, the one who provided the test, and uh, they is interested in piloting the preemptive pre pre testing in some uh, hospitals. Okay. <clears throat> so it should be, should be no surprise that the people who are uh, willing to actually answer the survey are also willing to come with uh, their, their thoughts uh, during the meeting itself. And so there are some overlaps in terms of, of that. And so what I've summarized here, uh, or what uh, Circumed and I have summarized here, is uh, some of the, of the discussion. We had a very vigorous discussion over the two-hour period. Plus, there was a subgroup of us that had a discussion over the 45 minutes that we spent on the wrong bus trying to get back to the, uh, the Metro Center. Um, but we now know a lot more about the uh, NIH campus. So please talk to uh, Dave or, or, or Dave or, or um, who was, Matt uh, if you need any directions on the campus. So uh, one, one point that was brought out uh, is that these are iatrogenic events. And unlike some of the other events that, that uh, we, we care for, um, there is an extra bit of responsibility that falls on, on us uh, b because of, of um, who caused them. Um, these are not things that are occurring uh, out in the wild. These are, are things that are occurring because of, a, of an act 
uh, within uh, the uh, branch of allopathic medicine that we most all uh, practice. Um, and so uh, th there is this moral obligation that's, a, that's maybe even you consider, consider above um, some of the other obligations that we have. And so we want to, as we implement, uh, sometimes it won't be all just about costs, but there'll be uh, also about uh, the, this principle. Um, another thing that came out is that it's really hard to think about implementing, or for that matter, doing a lot of the basic research, when we really don't have a clue what the burden of the problem is. You know, we, we know the cases, and those of us who have managed some of these cases will never forget them, uh, because they are in, indeed a motive. But we, we really don't know what the frequency is in, in most countries, in, including the one that we all happen to be in at this moment. And, and so there's some, there's some basic landscape definition that is needed. Um, we, we haven't even seen a, a study of whether uh, the, the uh, HLA alleles uh, replicate in Asian Americans, for example. A study that you think would have been done, and I was happy to see who was it? Steve, I think, showed some data that the Canadians have, have gone down that route. So I guess we could say uh, North America has been done. But um, the, the idea that there are some really s simple, straightforward things that could be done. Well, not simple. There are some straightforward things that could be done uh, to, to help us uh, think about how to apply things in this country. Um, we're, we are you know, way behind Thailand in terms of, of understanding the, the problem. Um, it was brought out by, by Matt and others, um, what's really going to move the, the needle? And, and genetics by itself is, is not enough. And, and really, we, we can't think of this as a genetics problem, but rather a clinical problem for which genetics can be a, a, an important contributor. And al almost every uh, successful example on the pharmaco side um, has included organ function and body size and this and that, um, in addition to genetics, in, in order to really um, hone things down to either divert to a different drug or a different dose or whatever it might be. And so uh, there, there's some work that needs to be done in terms of defining uh, that before implementation can be uh, r really more straightforward. The, the downstream impl uh, implications of changing therapy also is, is needed, and uh, Dave Morgolis and others brought this up, where um, are the alternatives better, the same, worse? I mean, are, you know, what, what are we diverting people to? You know, are we diverting them from, uh, from Heathrow Airport to uh, Baghdad, uh, or are we diverting them from Heathrow Airport to Paris, which is not a, necessarily a bad diversion. So, you know, that, the idea of where we're going uh, needs to be more, more clearly defined. And that really came out in, in Dave Venstra's uh, talk and, and others. Um, this focus on one gene, one drug it will, will rarely be favorable economically. Uh, and so uh, we, we need to be looking at, at panels or other approaches uh, that, um, that, that could face that if, you know, it's really almost uh, setting ourselves up for, for failure if we go down the economic route uh, to, to look at the cost of doing one, one gene when, when you really, it's a very similar cost to do an entire panel and, and then you get to uh, amortize that uh, across the panel. The, um, the next thing is uh, really we don't have a lot of data on how people will behave when faced with uh, data such as, uh, as a, a risk of, of, of SJS10. Um, and so there are um, e examples that could be done. We put one of them there where we could survey uh, patients, maybe through the, the advocacy organizations, their loved ones, the general population, and try to look at differences in, in um, the way one would, would respond to this kind of, of risk. Uh, because we just don't really know uh, whether, uh, whether we're doing the right thing or, or, or how to do the right thing. Um, it's, it's also uh, a little bit of a changing atmosphere in the United States anyway for who bears the, the extra cost of, of this iatrogenic event. And frankly, in, in the past, uh, the, the uh, incidence of, of a severe event such as, as SGS-10 um, has, has, if anything, been economically positive to a, to a health uh, center. Um, and, and because they get the, the money that comes in uh, for, for the management of that patient, um, even though it was an iatrogenic event. And so with some of the movement uh, towards more of a bundling, bundling of care um, or uh, a lack of payment for iatrogenic events, suddenly the focus becomes a little bit clearer for an individual health system or an individual uh, uh, polyphysician pra practice to, to try to get it right the first time. And so I think we need to focus a little bit more on, on who, who currently bears these costs because they should be the ones that would be our partners to, to help solve them. And then it was brought out that there are quantitative methods, qualitative methods rather, uh, uh, that have not really been uh, clearly defined from the patient. And if we want to talk about that more, we'll get uh, Dave Margolis and others to, to go further. But that, that um, we, we, we really haven't um, been looking at 
at, at patients, at their responses, how things, uh, how things would, would, uh, would be in terms of trying to implement these things. And then the last little thing, I put a little space between it because it's, it's not really implementation, but um, it was brought out that, that um, currently most of us uh, in, in this room um, have uh, decided to have on our driver's license or whatever the, the document might be uh, to be a, an organ donor. And, and with that, we've pledged to have HLA testing done on ourselves after we, we die. So it was brought out, uh, I won't name names, but Alan Schuldiner um, <laughs> brought out that, uh, um, uh, that, that um, maybe we should be doing the HLA, test, HLA testing now, benefit from it for these other aspects, and be ready uh, for our organ donation when that time comes. Um, and, you know, there's some problems with that. We don't want people um, going and hunting down people with the right HLAs in order to get that <laughs> kidney. Um, but um, there's, there's uh, not enough hotel rooms and ice baths in, uh, in Las Vegas to get all those illegal kidneys done. But, uh, but the, the idea uh, that, we, that we could be thinking about some other ways of benefit of this data um, now and later um, was, I think, Alan's point. And, and certainly in terms of implementation, you know, creative things like that, where we may get it for a number of reasons, but it would also benefit the prevention of these types of syndromes. It was really the point that, that he and others were making. So I, I think I'll stop there. Maybe I could open it up first, if it's OK uh, uh, with you, uh, to other members of the committee to fill in the blanks that I, uh, uh, that Circumet and I um, inadvertently left. So any? Dave, Dave, others? Mike? If you're a bone marrow donor, I think you get your results now rather than when yes. you die. Right. All right, general questions? Yes. Or comments? So I, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the admixed populations issue. You had you had said you you know uh, early on you, you felt yeah that that was a, that was an important topic. So so what would we need to do in order to, to address that? Well, I, th I think my take on that was that there was st still some worry that when you found a marker for a population, you found it for that population and its its relevance across. Uh, to other populations is, uh, is, is, is not known. And so the, the admixture element, uh, one of them is, is you, it's going to be harder, even harder to label people in the future because we're going to be admixed. And then there was also the, the idea that, that ad, the existing admixture um, is, is different. You know, 1,000 genomes is nice, but it's only a very limited uh, set of the population in the world. Um, and so, you know, even the data like, you know, Manira, I can't remember what, Mike, what you called it. it. was unsettling, I think, was the term you used when Manir presented that data with the Italians. You're like, oh, you know, what are we, what are we going to do? So there's, there's a lot of, of need in terms of trying to understand, is there five different markers that cause SGS10 and carbamazepine around the world, and we found two of them? Or is there one, and that we found two tags in different populations for that one? Or you know what? You know, so there's there's both of those issues. So so it's it's less about admixture in an individual and more about ethnic diversity. Yeah, I shouldn't say less about because that was definitely part of the discussion in terms of future generations. Um, well, you know what what will you call yourself? You know, you know so. Dave. Yeah, I, I, very nice presentation of, of what we talked about, but to be. Can you come a little closer to the mic? To be consistent with the, that's way too loud. <laughs> Even I don't like that, um, although my kids might. Um, to, to be consistent with the first group, but many of these studies and many of the things we suggested could become part of studies that would be done as a large national cohort system or a large national registry. Um, these would all be compatible with studies on individuals who have disease or uh, family members who have disease as well. So it would all fit nicely into what was sort of being proposed by some of the individuals uh, at near the end of the first presentation. Cynthia? Oh, yes, I think uh, uh, Elizabeth raised that they, it's the interpretation of the data that's um, so critical. So was there any discussion about um, you know, training of uh, individuals or even a medical specialty that would become the interpreters of all this data? So that, that wasn't a major feature of our discussion, although it's a, it is a real issue. I, I guess maybe there was, uh, part of it, we, we had such a vigorous discussion about the points that we were on, um, and part of it is, is the, the hope that um, Elizabeth will figure it out and we can just uh, use her, uh, her approach. But I do think that 
although we didn't discuss that, we did talk a little bit that you didn't capture here about the the uncertainty and, and both the communication of the uncertainty and also doing Thank some you. of this work in the presence of uncertainty, both about some of it coming from the rareness, but some of it also coming from other aspects of the disease. So I don't know if you or someone else from the group wants to elaborate on that a little bit more. Yeah, thank you for that. I, um, I don't, but just because I don't know how to. <laughs> so one of the things that did come up also, going back to this issue of what's the frame of reference for a certain demographic group, that currently people self-identify. They say, I am Chinese or I am whatever, over time that's gonna become more confusing as people are, uh, as the genetic drift is increasing because of globalization. So the, one of the challenges going forward, if there are different markers that, that from different, come from different populations as founder markers that for risk that will eventually get mixed together, is actually how to do a snapshot that's a objective snapshot of the genetic background of that individual. So the question is, is there from a genetics perspective for geneticists when they say this genome is, has this complexion, what, what actually are the, what are the markers of, the, of that individual from, from the point of view of where they all came from? Is there a measure, a genetic measure in the genome that gives the frame of reference other than I'm, you know, I'm African American or I'm Chinese American, which is very, I mean, African American is all over the place genetically. So, so the, you know, so again, it's, it's a very arcane point of reference and it needs to be replaced with something more, m more modern. Any other comments or questions for this group? Oh, go ahead. One of the things I spoke about in my participation in this group, thank you, yeah. was talk to the victims of SJS. It's a wealth of information, um, how it's impacted them physically, economically, especially the family members and the ones who have had children. And they would love to talk and tell you what their circumstances are. and that hopefully could provide something that would provide everybody here with something that could move forward, whatever it is that you have in mind. Okay. You know, that's our hope. And like I said, we're available if you want to talk to these people. Thank you. And, and thank you for your, your help um, at, at this meeting. I, um, I mean, there have been some of the comments you've made have really been uh, enlightening in terms of some of the problems that we've, we've, we've kind of been focusing on, do you get it or not? And then you've really highlighted a lot of the longitudinal aspects that have been kind of invisible. Um, I think Manir was, had his hand up first. And yeah, then Mark. Manir and then Mark, yes. Yes, I just wanted to comment on the pilot study. Um, you've got a, a bullet point there. So uh, for 31 on carbamazepine, we've done a patient preference study, oh. it done discrete choice experiment. And, and pay, uh, but basically, let me just read out uh, what one thing. So the odds of preferring an anti-epileptic drug decreased by 99% for every 1% increase in the risk of severe ADR. This is from patients, and some patients were willing to sacrifice a degree of efficacy to have the drug to be more safe, and so they would prefer to have a genetic test than not to have a genetic test. And we, I've, I've got data in terms of how much they'd be willing to pay to be able to prevent an adverse drug reaction. Right. So great, and so Mark, That's just great. Dave Veenstra, since you were one of the people who brought that up, do you want to respond to that point before we move on a little? No, uh, I think that'd be incredibly useful, um, in a lot of in a lot of different ways. Um, under, uh, understanding how to best implement programs, et cetera. Mark? Great. I wanted to uh, respond uh, relating to the patient perspective and contextualize it. Uh, and I don't know if this came up at the discussion or not since I was in a different work group, but NHGRI is funding um, uh, an uh, economic uh, analysis of um, uh, HLA 1502 and, and Stephen Johnson syndrome through the University of Florida IGNITE a group where we're trying to develop an economic model that uh, is would have a certain degree of uh, generic uh, quality so that uh, essentially that curve that David showed, people could plug in a discrete set of things like allele frequency, cost of an episode, cost of the test, and could basically get a rough idea without having to have an a degree in economics to say is this something that we should consider 
doing more work on or not. Um, and as part of that, um, we're using some standardized uh, methodology that had been used in Thailand uh, to determine the impact on the patient. Uh, and so I think if uh, that's a direction that you want to go, what I would recommend is that we, um, again, use that sort of standardized approach that's already been used in some of the economic modeling and do that more broadly. And it sounds like we have a, a group that would be willing to probably contribute data that would be yeah. highly useful. Yeah, yeah. That's great. <laughs> Oh, go ahead, Mike. Just have a, a question and a comment. Are the Ignite, a little closer to your microphone? Are the Ignite programs testing for these alleles? I, I'm not aware of any Ignite program testing for carbamazepine, but maybe Florida is. Um, we locally are looking at implementing uh, some of the HLA things, and Elizabeth could talk more about that. Goes back to sort of a, a fundamental question. I think we have a we as a society haven't really committed to the fact that screening patients for these types of factors is important from preventing them in the clinic. And I think with all of these research proposals, we really have to keep that end game in mind. I mean, we can throw a lot of money and come up with new biomarkers, but if clinically it's never going to translate, I think we have to sort of take pause and figure out what it's going to take to deliver these types of tests in the clinic. Um, Mark. Yeah. Um, we have to have the answers before we can implement. I implementation is simple. It's dead solid simple. We, we implement pharmacogenomic stuff all the time uh, in the clinic. But if we don't have the data about whether it's worth it or not, then it's an opportunity cost. So I could, you know, instantiate an HLA testing algorithm for carbamazepine today. I'm not confident that there would be much value that would accrue to the healthcare system, my healthcare system in central Pennsylvania, uh, if I were to do that. And so um, uh, I can guarantee you that if I get an answer that says this is really going to work, I will turn it on. And I think there are a lot of systems that could do that through clinical decision support, um, enhanced electronic health records, um, guidelines that are computable, all those sorts of things. We're moving into an era where that is not going to be the rate limiting step. I, mean, I, I think one of the big hurdles, again, is with established drugs. If you get a new drug where the test is bundled with the drug, there's going to be much less of a problem. You're not going to have those barriers. People will just, it will just be considered to be part of prescribing the drug. I think every drug that we know that's established, and azathioprine is another example, like how many people are doing TPMT test, you know, testing. It's not that it's not, you know, effective. It's just that it's not ingrained in us. And with established drugs that physicians have prescribed for years without a test, it's then hard to implement a test. I mean, we used to do G6PD screening on every HIV patient, whether or not they were going to get prescribed Dapsone. And, and, you know, how much that, you know, the cost of that test compared to doing one lifetime test of 5701 or 1502, and also how much is the test itself in, in the capacity of the total lifetime health cost of the patient? I mean, that's something we also don't consider. We can do you know, seven metabolic screens, 10 CBCs, you know, it's just, it just goes on and on and on. And who measures the cost effectiveness of those screening tests, uh, screening tests, which may have no utility whatsoever? So, Dave Veenstra. I'm sorry, if I can just respond real quick. Okay. It's usually a life care planner who will go in and speak to the victim and measure out everything down to the last bit of Kleenex, and that's how it's measured about how long it will take and how much medical care it will take to sustain this person and give them what they need for the measure of their lifetime. So if that helps, we have that data. But, you know, if that's important, we really should come down. Yeah, that could be very helpful for uh, refining some of these evaluations. I, I mean, I don't think there's a major issue here on cost effectiveness. So there's an issue, but um, we're not seeing signals from the market, from the payers, that they're highly resistant. I mean, you, you saw some of those policies. Um, so I think we need a little bit more data. We've already got people doing mo some modeling work in the U.S. We need a little bit of U.S. relevant data for that. We've got some good, basically, this conjoint analysis stuff. It's it's a tool for marketing. Actually, it's really helpful to understand how people will perceive things. So we have nice bits of data. Um, you know, I think I think some of the other issues are around having a, a practical, easy to use, rapid turnaround kind of issues. So 
I mean, I just voice a, a word of encouragement that from, from the from the value side, uh, my sense is that in certain pop, you know populations that are obviously more likely to have these variants in the United States, my guess is that it's going to be a good economic value, especially when you plug in these costs, these patients that we're hearing about. Anything else? Okay, well, we'll go ahead on now to the working group three. 